Holland. Mr. William Holland, Auditor General of Illinois, is here on behalf of the National Association of State Auditors. Mr. David Gregan, Chief Procurement Officer for Washington, D.C., and is here on behalf of the National Association of State Procurement o Officials. Welcome. Mr. Jerome Hare. 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 Mr. Jerome Hare is here, the Director of Audits for the County of Milwaukee, and is here on behalf of the Association of Local Government Auditors. Mr. Jerry Brito is Senior Research Fellow. Of course, and uh, we're delighted to have all of you here. And of course, what we would do is that, uh, as you know, this committee, we swear everybody in. So we'd like for you to stand and raise your right hand. You agree to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? If so, let answer in the affirmative. Let the record reflect that all of them answered in the affirmative. So Mr. Holland, we will begin with you. And as you know, that if you probably heard me say it, that you have five minutes to, uh, and then after that, we will have a question and answer, and we'll just go right down the row. Thank you very much. Mr. Holland. Thank you. Chairman Towns and Ranking, um, and ranking Member Issa, who was uh, maybe voting, and members of the committee, I'm pleased to be here today on behalf of the National Association of State Auditors, Controllers, and Treasurers to discuss oversight related, uh, related to the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. While I may draw upon my experience as the State Auditor in Illinois, I am here to represent public servants and financial officials nationwide who take pride in ensuring that taxpayer dollars are monitored and used for their intended purposes. Accountability is always our number one priority. However, the challenges of our current economy, coupled with the rapid spending authorized by the Recovery Act, am I a little too close, too strong? Yeah. Pardon me, I didn't hear what you said. Uh, let me go back. Accountability is always our number one priority. However, the challenges of our current economy, coupled with the rapid spending authorized by the Recovery Act, make accountability more critical than at any other time in our government. Still a problem? No. We believe Don't worry about it. We generally can't hear witnesses, but we hear you. I'm sorry. So I you can continue. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, we believe accountability can be achieved by clearly defining responsibilities and coordinating the various participants. The Recovery Act and the initial implementing guidance issued by OMB specifically give federal departments and agencies, such as the Federal Inspector Generals, the GAO, and the Recovery Accountability and Transparency Board, primary responsibility for maintaining accountability over Recovery Act funds. Substantial dollars are appropriated to each of these entities for that singular purpose. The Recovery Act provides neither direct responsibility nor direct funds for oversight efforts at the state and local level. Nonetheless, management of these dollars, once they leave the federal government's hands, as well as the cost associated with that effort, is of utmost concern to our organization's members. State auditors already bears significant responsibility for oversight of federal spending programs by state agencies pursuant to the Single Audit Act and its amendments. These audits are generally conducted annually and provide assurance to the federal government as to the management and use of such funds by recipient states and their subrecipients. OMB's initial implementing guidelines, guidance recognizes the importance of the single audit process in two key ways. First, in developing risk mitigation plans, federal departments and agencies are required to consider prior audit findings involving federal programs through which Recovery Act funds will be dispersed. And second, single audits are specifically identified in the guidance as an audit tool integral to promoting accountability over recovery grants. Clearly, the importance of the single audit process is magnified rather than minimized by the Recovery Act's emphasis on accountability. 
Nonetheless, during this period of rapid spending, there may be a desire at the national level to increase or alter some existing accountability processes. It will be important to define and communicate any changes in the single audit process in a timely and expeditious manner to the state audit community. We have been fortunate that both the GAO and OMB have been reaching out to the entire accountability community to discuss implementation of Recovery Act requirements. However, we are still uncertain as to our specific roles and what the cost and funding sources for fulfilling our roles will be. Staffing and other necessary resources in our offices throughout the nation are at an all-time low. Due to the influx of stimulus money to the states, fulfilling our single audit functions will certainly encompass more federal programs. This in turn will cause us to incur additional audit hours and perform more tests than in previous years. We believe the appropriated dollars would be better spent by the federal agencies on efforts to mitigate risk at the front end of the process. For instance, by conducting tests and reviewing prior audit findings to ensure that recipient agencies have a strong internal control process in place prior to their receipt and expenditure of Recovery Act funds. To the extent that Recovery Act funds throw, flow through existing federal programs, these dollars will already be subject to audit in accordance with the Single Audit Act and OMB Circular 133. I should also note that financial officials other than the in independent external auditor are very important to this discussion. Specifically, I am referring to state controllers and treasurers that are responsible for the disbursement and reconciliation of funds. I can tell you that the controllers are very concerned about the reporting requirements and how that information will be gathered and reported. While much of the financial information is housed in the state's accounting system, some of the information is actually gathered at the state agency level. This dichotomy brings up concern regarding reconciliation. We wonder at the state level whether the federal government is going to require central state reporting directly to recovery.gov, individual state agency reporting directly to recovery.gov, or individual state agencies reporting to a federal agency, which is then responsible for assuring that the information is posted at recovery.gov. We await further guidance, timely and expeditious, from the federal government as to the regard of the reconciliation as it will be extremely important. We stand ready to work with our federal counterparts to assure the most efficient and effective method for reporting is established. I should also point out the important role that internal auditors will play within individual agencies or at the statewide level in assuring that pre-disbursement internal controls are functioning properly and effectively. I am happy to join here today with the Chair of the Recovery Board and other important organizations. Individually and collectively, our groups have long been at the forefront of ensuring public accountability. In a talk at the White House Recovery and Reinvestment Act Implementation Conference last week, the President emphasized his commitment to accountability and he said, if we see money being mis misspent, we will call it out. Well, I can the assure light you is on that red, the, the accountability sum up. The light is on red, but you sum up. Oh, it did? I didn't yeah. see it. I was, yeah. You got to the end of my comments. Right. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just before we go to you, Mr. Uh, Gregan, I would like to yield to the gentlewoman from New York. for. I, I thank the chairman for, for granting me a point of personal privilege. I am literally on the floor with Chairman Rangel uh, with the AIG Accountability and Bonus uh, Act that we have been working on, on all week. But I wanted to place my remarks in the record will send my questions to the individuals and uh, compliment the leadership of our chairman and ranking member for a careful, sharp pencil and oversight on the recovery monies. Congratulations. Thank you. And I have to go back to the floor. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the gentlewoman for her support as well. Uh, Mr. Gregan. Good afternoon, Chairman Towns, members of the committee. Uh, I'm David Gregan. I'm the Chief Procurement Officer of the City of Washington, D.C. And I'm also representing today the National Association of the State Procurement Officials, the organization of the 50 state procurement directors, as well as the City of Washington and the U.S. territories. We really thank you for this opportunity to comment on the role of the government procurement professional in preventing fraud, waste and abuse 
in the implementation of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. It is our view that State Chief Procurement Officers, or CPOs, are uniquely positioned to assist in the development of guidelines regarding use, timelines, and transparency of purchases we make as a result of this Act. NASPO recognizes that the effectiveness of a State CPO is clearly linked to his or her ability to engage with policymakers at the highest levels in government and that this engagement is critical to ensuring effective direction, coordination, and control over public expenditures. Additionally, State CPOs are charged with protecting all public funds from conflicts of interest, antitrust violations, fraud and abuse, and have already developed controls to address these concerns. Therefore, in order to proactively prevent fraud, waste and abuse under the Recovery Act, it is imperative that central procurement be given the opportunity from the outset to help in developing strategies for properly spending stimulus funds. In your invitation to NASPO to participate in this hearing, the Committee asks that we address three specific questions. First, what proactive steps are State procurement officials taking to prevent wasteful spending? It is imperative that we no longer wait for annual external audits to identify waste and fraud and abuse. Audit, in my opinion, is continuous. In D.C., we post information about every purchase, including purchase card transactions, on a website for public scrutiny. And that is the sort of transparency that I believe that this Act envisions and that we all as procurement professionals embrace. The eyes of the public are the most powerful tool against improper contracting behavior. In terms of developing specific safeguards and processes for stimulus funds and in anticipation of these projects, NASPO members are developing and using a variety of strategies to aid their staff and customer agencies in spending the Act stimulus money efficiently, effectively and most importantly, properly. Closer collaboration with our oversight partners in government, the auditors, the controllers, the inspectors general, that is number one among those tools that we are using right now. Communicating more aggressively, State central procurement offices must communicate guidance and expectations as well as best practices to user agencies and localities. Most States are issuing guidance to agency customers to promote uniformity of requests and reporting while other States are creating data collection forms for customer agencies to help identify and track stimulus funds. Many of us are creating focused procurement teams, which we have done here in Washington, D.C., to ensure that the stimulus contracting, which is on a unique timeline for public procurement, is still effectively managed. We recognize that the need to aggressively and proactively search out the needs of our customers as opposed to waiting for a requisition is different from the way procurement professionals typically do business. And finally, early identification of appropriate existing contracts. CPOs are encouraging their staffs to identify viable cooperative and pre-established contracts for internal use. Cooperative purchasing is an effective tool and popular because it can save significant time um, with existing already competed contracts for those commonly used needs. Many of the stimulus funds, I think, will be spent on existing needs. Number two, you asked, what plans do States have for audit and investigations to identify and prosecute fraud and stimulus programs? As discussed in almost all of the opening remarks of this committee this morning, transparency is a cornerstone of the Act and is an essential element of procurement strategies to identify waste, fraud and abuse. NASPO and its partner organizations are currently in discussions with OMB, with GAO and related agencies to identify the recommended flow of information as it relates to Act reporting and State CIOs are working closely with State CPOs and the stimulus teams to develop those reporting chains. The third question you asked was, what oversight challenges are State governments facing as we prepare to properly expend the stimulus funding? The overarching concern in central procurement and among the NASPO members as well as NIGP, the National Contract Management Association, all professional procurement associations is the rapidity with which we are expected to expend these funds. Generally, our concerns are related to the way we are going to manage data and the actual procurement operation. For data management, I will be very brief. It is about knowing what information we need, when we need it, when and how to report it. That has already been brought up and I won't belabor that. More importantly, the procurement operations. Government procurement typically does not respond well to compressed timelines. The process is built to be deliberative and methodical in seeking best value awards for every customer need. Our process was developed to deliver value while preventing fraud, waste and abuse and perhaps most importantly to instill public confidence in the way that their money is being spent. Requiring States to perform to accelerated timelines and procedures countervails 
the fair, open and transparent goals of the Act. The rapidity with which these funds must be con uh, contracted requires unprecedented communication, coordination and standardization across state agencies and the central procurement offices. In conclusion, with this great opportunity for procurement directors, for all of the citizens to accomplish the mission that our President and the Congress have given us, I would make three final points. As procurement professionals, we must plan carefully, we must execute flawlessly, and we must do so in a manner that is respectful to the public trust. We cannot forget nor forego that our, our responsibility to uphold the public integrity that is fundamental underpinning of government contracting. On behalf of NASPO, NIGP, NCMA and all the other public procurement professional organizations, I want to thank you for holding this hearing and for inviting you, inviting us to be part of this. Thank you very much for your statement. Uh, Mr. Herr. Congressman Towns, Chairman Towns. Sorry. Chairman Towns, Congressman Bill Bray. I am honored to be here today as a founding member of the Association of Local Government Auditors, ALGA, to speak with you on behalf of ALGA and to give you a broad overview of local government's efforts to ensure accountability for the use of Federal stimulus funds dispersed under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. But first I would like to say a little bit more about our organization. ALGA was founded in 1989 to support and strengthen local government auditing. We provide training and information sharing for members and assist local governments in establishing and maintaining independent audit functions. ALGA also provides a peer review program to assure the public that auditors meet professional standards. We currently comprise about 300 organizational members representing more than 2,000 local government auditors in cities, counties, school districts and authorities. Nearly 60 percent of our members are in the states that will be covered by the GAO in their longitudinal study of the uh, Long Range Use of Recovery Act funds. ELGA is well positioned to coordinate with the GAO in its mandate to monitor local use of the funds, <coughs> excuse me, because local government auditors possess in-depth knowledge of our operations, our organizations and our management controls. To that end, we have recently sponsored a teleconference with Acting Comptroller General Gene Didero to discuss how the Recovery Act will affect local governments and to coordinate oversight efforts. We have also invited the GAO to speak at our annual conference for a more in-depth discussion of the role local government auditors will play as we move forward. We have been asked about proactive steps local officials are taking to prevent uh, wasteful spending. Some of our member organizations have already started uh, monitoring the uh, requirements under the Act and communicating expectations to management. And some members are already providing fraud prevention training with special emphasis on Federal requirements. But you should have some comfort in the notion that our existing oversight infrastructure will also be very helpful in providing assurance that the Recovery Act funds are well spent and that the process is indeed transparent. These include the Single Audit Act, the performance audits that we conduct, our hotlines, and our long-standing strong relationship with auditors at different levels of government. With regard to the Single Audit Act, due to the size and scope of the Recovery Act, we anticipate that much of the newly available Federal assistance will indeed be subject to the single audit requirements. Our members either assist in conducting those audits or contract for them. As to performance audits, more than 80 percent of our members conduct performance audits, and these are designed to assess whether a program is achieving the intended benefits at a reasonable cost. But another important tool is our hotlines. Many local government audit organizations operate hotlines to receive information from vendors, employees and the public about waste, fraud and abuse. These audit organizations have established policies and procedures for investigating complaints and ultimately for referring cases for prosecution or other disciplinary action. We publicize our hotlines and we use them to vigorously pursue fraud in partnership with State and Federal prosecutors. Another key strength is our coordination with auditors at different levels of government. Local government auditors interact with Federal and State auditors in our work and through the National Intergovernmental Audit Forum and its 11 regional forums. The mission of the forums is to improve cooperation among its members to enhance government accountability and transparency and to increase the public trust. We were also asked to describe our plans for audits and investigations to identify and prosecute fraud and stimulus programs. Most of our member organizations have not yet scheduled specific audits of programs funded by the Recovery Act because we are still learning how our governments will be affected. However, we anticipate that many of these high-profile programs are already an existing part of our audit plans. 
Additionally, most of our member organizations base their audit plans on risk analysis. Because federal funds carry inherent compliance risks, we anticipate that local governments and audit organizations will add audits of these projects to their plans. Most importantly, the large majority of ELGA members follow standards that require us to pursue potential fraud when we do conduct our audits. The final topic we were asked to address was the challenges we face in meeting our oversight obligations. While we recognize the potential benefits that the stimulus funds provide for our local economies, we do face three significant challenges. First, despite our efforts, we estimate that fewer than 20 percent of the nation's larger cities and counties have an independent audit function. If I could offer one suggestion to improve accountability nationwide, it would be that you craft a way to encourage more local jurisdictions to create audit functions. Ultimately, every taxpayer would benefit with better oversight of federal dollars spent at the local level. The second challenge is resources. The majority of our local government audit organizations are very small in comparison to the audit uh, resources that we audit. One third of our members have only one or two staff. Finally, most local governments have experienced budget reductions in the current economic downturn. Many of our member organizations have cut positions or implemented furloughs. But let me close by saying that despite these challenges, we welcome the opportunity to work closely with the GAO, with the Inspector General community, and with state auditors to provide oversight of local government's use of the federal stimulus funds. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jerry Brito, and I'm a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University and uh, an adjunct professor of law at George Mason University School of Law. I want to thank you for inviting me to testify on preventing stimulus waste and fraud. Uh, this committee knows why it's so important to keep close tabs on the nearly $800 billion of spending contained in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. The question is, how do we do it? Dozens of inspectors general and official auditors around the country will follow the stimulus money. Uh, they will do commendable work, but they can't possibly look at every payment and every transaction. While we might want to, we can't hire an army of auditors charged with tracking every single dollar. However, we can supplement a very small number of professional auditors with a very large number of small contributions from citizens. That is, we can crowdsource accountability the same way that Wikipedia crowdsources the writing of an encyclopedia. In fact, this very testimony that I am reading was crowdsourced. I published a draft of it on a wiki webpage and alerted other transparency enthusiasts and academics of its existence. In the 24 hours that the wiki was online, over a dozen persons made edits and additions to these words, all of them adding value. If the government requires clear, timely, and profound reporting of how every dollar is spent, everyone, not just government auditors, could keep track of the money. Millions of citizens around the country could be able to look at the transactions related to recovery-funded projects in their neighborhoods. How would government enlist the help of citizens to keep recovery spending accountable? It doesn't have to. It just has to provide the data. If the government makes the raw spending data available, a strong community of transparency enthusiasts and scholars will build tools that allow citizens to sift, sort, and report it. There doesn't have to be just one recovery.gov. If we make the data available, citizens can take that data and make many recovery.govs with different focuses and different sort of presentations of the data. Earlier this year, I launched the website stimuluswatch.org with the help of two very talented volunteer software developers, Peter Snyder and Kevin Dwyer. The site presents nearly uh, 20,000 shovel-ready projects that the U.S. Conference of Mayors reported as candidates for stimulus funding. Citizens can easily find a list of projects in their hometown and then rate, discuss, and add factual context to each project. Now that you have passed the Recovery Act, we want to expand the capabilities of our website to allow citizens to track the projects uh, that will be funded in their communities. I know that other web developers would like to make similar tools, including applications that track job creation and to plot stimulus dollars on maps coded with unemployment and other statistics. There is no limit to the number of useful and innovative presentations that public-minded netizens can create. However, before we can make useful tools for the American public, uh, the community of transparency innovators needs the raw spending data in full. To make sure we have that, we need you to clarify and strengthen existing data disclosure requirements. There are two key issues that need clarification that I'd like to bring to your attention today. The depth of disclosure and standardization. First is the question of how deeply disclosure will go. While the Recovery Act requires that recipients of federal stimulus funds report to the awarding agencies uh, how the funds are spent, there is no clear instruction that every level of subcontract or subgrant must be disclosed. The OMB guidance interpreting the Act states that only the, quote, prime non-federal recipients of federal funding and th the subawards made by these prime recipients are on the hook for reporting to recovery.gov. Uh, 
This is very troubling. If the government wants to ensure meaningful accountability, then we must have transparency at every level of transaction. It is not enough for citizens, citizens to know that the EPA made a grant to Florida, which in turn made a subgrant to Miami, where I'm from. We also need to know that Miami made a payment to Acme Concrete, which a citizen with local knowledge could recognize and flag as a firm donned by the council member's son-in-law. Right now, it is not clear we will get this information. The second key issue is standardization. At this point, the OMB guidance does not explain what data elements we should expect recovery.gov to publish. By data elements, I mean such things as project name, contractor, amount spent, purpose of the project, jobs created, street address, city, state, etc. If you think of the raw data as a spreadsheet, we would like to know what the column headers will be. We also don't know in what format the, the information will be presented. As I explained more thoroughly in my written testimony, ideally the data would be published in a structured format such as extensible markup language, known as XML. In his first day in office, the President signed a memorandum on transparency and open government. The three central themes of the memorandum to which the President committed the administration are transparency, participation, and collaboration. A community of interested and knowledgeable parties wants to participate and collaborate with the government to make online disclosure of recovery spending data succeed. For example, a wide range of groups and individuals from all parts of the political spectrum have formed a coalition for an accountable recovery, and I commend you and the administration uh, the coalition's vision statement and proposed online transparency architecture, which I have attached to my written testimony. I'm happy to report that so far the administration has been quite good at listening to suggestions from those of us who are interested in recovery data. Unfortunately, uh, it has not been as good at sharing information in return, a necessity in true collaboration. Ideally, the folks building recovery.gov would be allowed to talk with us so we can learn what they are planning and we can tell them what we'd like to see included. We're willing to help track the stimulus money and take part of responsibility for seeing it well spent, but to do so, we need the data. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me thank uh, all of you for your, your testimony. Uh, let me begin with you. Um, Mr. Brito, being you just uh, finish up, I'll come right back to you. Yes. Um, would you agree that technology is not a barrier to solving problems? It's not a barrier to solving the problems? No. Um, I mean, it, it, is a, it is a barrier to the extent that um, there are legacy systems in place uh, uh, in government and at the state level um, that might not be quite at the speed that need, that need to be to report the data. To that extent, it could be a barrier. But it's a barrier that could be overcome. All right. You know, uh, let me put this to you, Mr. Holland, Mr. Hare, and also uh, Mr. Gregan. Um, as you may know, there are strong provisions in the Recovery Act protecting state, local, and contractor employees that report fraud and waste in connection with stimulus spending. Do you have a broad plan on how to harness citizen and whistleblowers uh, involvement in keeping an eye on stimulus spending? Do you plan to publicize the new whistleblower protections in order to encourage whistleblowers to come forward? Let me just go down the road. Let me start with you, Mr. Holland. I'll start with you and then come down the line. Mr. Chairman, I, I think that the, uh, the, the best way to address the fraud and abuse that might occur is catch it before it begins, which is exactly what, uh, what, what, what I said in my, my statement. And it's probably to rely more upon Mr. Gregan's people, the, the, the procurement officers, to go back and take a look at what we said in our single audits, where there were weaknesses in internal controls in procurement and in contracting policies, strengthen the procurement policies that might be out there to avoid, to avoid any fraud and abuse that might take place. But as it does take place, uh, auditors uh, at the state level um, are, are uh, always uh, prepared to uh, disclose any fraud, any abuse, any waste that, that they, they come across. Yeah. We do so already. Right. Strengthen the procurement policies. What, is, what does that really mean? I think it means really the policies generally, as I mentioned in my oral remarks, are in place. They need to be reemphasized. People need to be, in many cases, trained again on the meaning of those policies. I would suggest to your specific question, Mr. Chairman, that we have whistleblower protections in place. I think we have very good ones in the City of Washington, D.C. and the other two very large governments that I've had the privilege of being a, an official in. Uh, I would say we need to reemphasize them. As we try now, the, 
one of our greatest antiseptics to anything going wrong here is just massive communications, whether it's by website, some of the things Mr. Brio said, and many others of us have said, let's communicate more aggressively, let's make it so easy for any interested member, whether it's the, pu the public or the press or any oversight function that has a, a um, direct role in the process of overseeing the expenditure of funds, let's make it ultra easy for them to see where every dollar goes, and not only that, to inquire as to the legitimacy of any expenditure. So I, I think now is as good a time as any, a better time probably than most, to reemphasize those whistleblower protections that I think we do have in place. Right. You think it's easier now to do it with uh, Devaney coming in uh, in the picture? I do, does that make it more difficult? I, I don't, I'll be honest with you. I don't know the specifics of exactly how these roles are going to hash out. I think the idea of putting a, 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 an organization in place to be responsible as a single point of information, if you will, a single point of truth, I'll call it, because I love that phrase. Um, I think that's the right idea. So, and I'm, we've got to make it work. Right. Mr. Hare. Mr. Chairman, I would agree that this is a time to reinforce uh, existing practices of dealing with whistleblowers, but I would also suggest that it's a time uh, for local governments to maybe think about starting up uh, hotlines and, and providing whistleblower protections through their, uh, through their local legislation. Uh, we started our hotline in 1994. We were not the first. But there are a lot of governments that just have started very recently uh, bringing up hotlines at the local level. The City of Milwaukee is only a couple of years old. Um, the State of Wisconsin just put theirs up uh, last year. And if you're going to take information from people alleging fraud, you need to have a well-positioned whistleblower protection. So I think that we will use this opportunity to try and reinforce and expand the use of hotlines at the local government level. You know, um, one of the things that's been talked about a great deal is the inability to um, Communicate, and uh, and of course, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I suggested to the uh, vice president to call in uh, and have a summit to see, in terms of from a technology standpoint, to see if we can't sort of have everybody on the same page, you know, and um, and of course, I'm being discouraged at the fact that they're saying that I'm being unrealistic. I mean, these are coming from professionals. I mean, I, and uh, to the point where you know, I'm saying, you know, uh, why can't we do this? I'd like to just sort of get some opinions on it. Mr. Brito, you, you, you touched upon it earlier. You know, uh, what do you think would stop us from doing it? You know, I mean, you know, well, I mean, like I said, I mean, there are going to be some legacy systems, and by that I mean old computers that yeah. can't, that don't have the capability right. uh, to produce the sort of um, data formats that we need. But aside from that, and uh, I, I think that you can, you can get the data out in, in a useful enough format that others can take and aggregate. And, and make it useful on recover.gov and other websites. So I guess to, to answer your question directly, um, no, technology should not stop us, right? This is an unprecedented amount of money that we're spending. It's the American people's money, and they'd have a right to know how it's being spent. And the best whistleblowers are the folks who don't know they're whistleblowers, right? If they can go online, look up the projects that are in their neighborhoods, and say, boy, I know something about this project, that, that's what's important. Right. Any other comments before I yield to uh, my... Uh I, I would I would add to this that at, at the at the federal level, um, rightfully so, you talk in trillions and billions. At the state level, we talk in billions and millions. At Jerry's level, they talk in millions and thousands. When we start inputting that that information at the millions and thousands level across the country, with lots of different people having responsibility for inputting that data and, and deciding what is a job created, what is not a job created. And it may be different in Springfield, Illinois versus Brooklyn. It may be different in Miami or, or in Chicago. It's going to be different all over the place. It's a very complex issue and lots of bits of information that at some point you're going to want to look at and say it all is the same. And that is a challenge before us to create all that information the same across the country so that the proper analysis can be done. And it is not an easy, it is not an easy job to do. And, I'm, and, I, and I, I, I caution you to have a realistic approach that when you start thinking about the, the just the people are going to put it in. The people are going to say, this is the spending for this two-week period. It's going to vary all over the country. It is a real challenge at the grassroots entry, data entry level. And ultimately, it's going to get to you, but you want it to be right. Yeah. But, you know, uh, the reason I'm so concerned is that, you know, um, everybody is saying that uh, $55 billion will be wasted if we are not uh, uh, careful. 
and um, and of course uh, that to me is very disturbing. You know, that's B as in boy, yeah. fifty-five billion. You know, that's a lot of money, and we, and I feel that we could do a lot of things with that money if it's wasted. Then you know, uh, I think that uh, uh, we're not doing the American uh, um, uh, public, you know, uh, uh, the service that we're supposed to be providing. If we're allowing $55 billion to go out the back door, side door, whatever door, you know, um, so uh, I think that's a real concern. So I think it's an issue that we need to continue to talk about. I yield now to. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me uh, first go over and say, Mr. Holland, I want to just say, you know, from where you come from, the job you've done in the past, you're the meanest SOB I think that has ever counted beans. So I appreciate that. And the challenges in, in um, D.C. Uh, astonish me. As a former mayor, I would love to have a shot at this city for, for a few years, but uh, the real challenge is there. Um, I got a question for you. When we were bringing this bill up, there was a discussion about putting conditions in so we made sure we direct these funds in a certain way. And, and in fact, the senators kept wanting to strike some of the, the guidelines because they said, don't worry, this is a general, we, we have oversight. Um, how far does this, the um, oversight and our hands-on ability go, uh, I guess the way to explain it is, when the federal government contracts with somebody to do a project, we have direct oversight, the administration has direct oversight, there is a contractual relationship. When it goes through the state and then through down to the city and the county, is that contractual relationship broken? Or does the contract or implied contractual relationship follow the money as it's going through and thus the accountability follows the money as it goes through? Or is the nexus separated at the state line and we are now at a whole different relationship that our ability to hold a contractor on the at the city accountable has been broken because we went through that system? Well, I, I think if, if I can jump to what I think the answer you might be looking for is that under the Single Audit Act, when that money comes to the state and it's that federal programs being spent and there's, and, and, and uh, the, uh, who, who's responsible for that accountability? At the state level, that's me. At the city level, that's Jerry. Um, so that, that accountability, that single audit, that, 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 that tracking that federal funds, and, and with regard to the stimulus money, it is our understanding that the vast majority of the stimulus money will go through existing federal programs, which means to say we will be responsible under those existing programs and that existing single audit program for the accountability of those funds. Does, does that get that but question? Does your, let's just say if you do it through um, a city program. Let's just say we're, we're building construction. We have standards that are on the books and are coming onto the books that are a federal minimum for every contractor. When you accept those funds, is there an implied contract that you are now a contractor and fall under that? You, you have to live like you do other guys, or are you a, exempt from that to where you don't have to follow the same, um, same rules as somebody who's to, who is a private sector contractor with the federal government? Mr. Chairman, uh, in my experience, when we audit that dollar spent at the con contractor or subcontractor level, we audit against the criteria that is established uh, at whatever point upstream we got the money from, whether it's the state or federal government. So if you've got restrictions on those funds as to how they must be spent, those attach to our audit program and we follow through on those restrictions. Okay, because were, let me just be very frank. There was a real concern here that we make sure that when we create jobs, we create legal jobs. We are not going to have hundreds of thousands of people that are illegal using false documents, false social securities, getting this job. There were senators that said the condition that we put on at the House to require E-Verify was repetitive because the administration was now going to require as of March that all federal contractors had to use E-Verify. The question is this. You know, is it understood that part of the fraud and abuse part of this is that when you hire somebody under this, this fund, you're going to make sure that they are, that they're so secure they are who they claim to be and that they're qualified under under federal law to work legally in this in this um, country the, the the big question is does that requirement that the that this administration is going to apply to federal contractors will that be followed um, will that follow the money all the way down to the local level 
Well, we, we would hope that that would be done at the front end where the people who were responsible for administering that program would, would, would uh, follow the law. And then if that is the law, if that's a provision within that contractual arrangement, that would be subject to, to audit by either the, a state auditor or a, uh, or a local auditor. I would agree with that, Mr. Chairman. So in other words, a, um, what you're going to look for is specific language in the grant or in, in the text of the grant rather than the general policy of the federal government. You've got, you, you need that specifically stated. Because I'm wondering here, because there's all kinds of fraud and abuse that I don't think is specifically stated um, that you will de facto pick up that um, I don't know about nepotism, I don't know about what kind of um, conflict of interest, and I assume in a lot of those contracts they're there, but there's a lot of this that I hope that you maintain as a standard that isn't specifically referred to in the grant but um, is sort of a common sense approach that you're not going to give this money to somebody or some group that's, that's in, um, in violation of the law. But the big question is, will, there be, will that apply also to this segment that the House strongly, or we overwhelmingly put into our bill that let's make sure that the only people that get the jobs or get these grants are people who are legally in the country by requiring E-Verify to be used? With, I can't speak to any specific program at this particular point, not knowing what's in each specific program, but if there are those restrictions, we will audit against those restrictions. Yes, sir. Um, I mean, I, I can't speak directly to uh, what the requirements are on uh, this gentleman right now, but they all seem to agree that they have, uh, um, they're accountable for how the money is spent, and they're in charge of making sure that the money is spent accountably, right? Um, what I'd like to know uh, and what I'd like to suggest is important as well as accountability um, uh, from the IG level is reporting. And, and so the question for me would be, um, uh, does the fact that the money goes from the federal government to the state to the city, does that still carry a reporting requirement where the city must report what were the contracts that were made, um, uh, who was paid, what for, and then any the sort of uh, uh, interest that you might have about how the money is being spent, a citizen in that locality can look at that contract and maybe raise the red flag uh, directly. Yeah, because one of the things you do is somebody says, oh, I hired this many people, and if you don't check that the Social Security number and name is actually viable, they could put any person they want, but there's no way for us to audit the books if there isn't that data available, and that data, the way you get that avail uh, data available is through E-Verify. You actually you know, go in Social Security and says, okay, this guy says it's his name, this is his um, number, and you match it up. And that allows auditors to say, yes, this was really a person, um, and we can verify that because here's the number, here's the name, and it's, it's been checked. That should be done by the people who are running the program at the front end. The, your goal should be never to see me again and as an auditor because yeah. things have been done right. Okay. I know, Mr. Chairman, I apologize, but there's one issue that um, uh, the reference to the recovery.gov being, um, not being up and going for another year, uh, somebody want to comment on that, Mr. Rito? Um, uh, yeah, I, I think that would be a, a real shame. I mean, uh, if the money's being spent now, uh, we need folks looking at the dollars being spent now to flag anything that might be inappropriate or might be wasteful. Uh, and, and this isn't just about gotcha games, right? This That's is, what we want to avoid is gotcha games. It is not about gotcha games. It's about uh, performance, really, in, in large part. And citizens on the ground are the best placed to, to uh, be able to communicate to uh, folks in their own uh, local government, in their state government, to you, uh, that the project that's going down in their, in their neighborhood, maybe it's a community center, maybe it's a bridge, uh, that it's not going very well. Right? Uh, maybe they can't get a job there, even though uh, there's supposed to be this many jobs available. Um, and the only way that you, you allow them to know what's going on is by releasing the data as soon as possible online. And I understand Mr. Devaney is facing many challenges, you know, least of which is uh, taking uh, over the site now uh, after 30 days. Um, uh, but I think they need to make that a top priority because that would mean enlisting millions of auditors which and are called the American people. And the chairman really has tried to make this get away from the gotcha game, get to avoid the problem to start with, and if the problem shows up, address it while it's small. Don't wait. And what I worry about with this item is we're gonna, we won't know for a year, and that could be enough time to for real problems, and then it ends up being a big blow up rather than a little problem we can address. Anybody else want to comment on that one year timeline problem? 
I, I would agree. That's, a, that's an ex excessively long period of time for us to start getting data. If we're, if we're going to have to wait that long, we'll probably rely on other resources so we can share information in the audit community and, and get ahead of pro problems and not wait, wait that long to find them. I, I just want to follow up on this, Mr. Chairman, because I think this is um, really, sim really shows what we've done in the past in the federal government. And if we're going to change the outcome, we not change the process. And I think this is one place Republicans and Democrats ought to be working together to help to keep this administration out of the gotcha game by us actually saying we need you to do, um, you, we need you to do the right thing first so, so we avoid having to point out that you did something wrong after the fact. I, I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that transparency is very, very important, and this is what we're really talking about. And I think that any way that we can do can do that. I think that uh, it's just so important because 787 billion dollars is a lot of money, and that we need to try to make certain that it is being spent properly. At this time, I yield to the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bruto. 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 Yeah. Uh, we've been throughout the day concerned, and I'd like your view on uh, the fact that apparently it's going to take an estimated year for recovery.gov to get to a level of transparency. Can you take us through how we can reduce that down to an acceptable, well, down to as close as possible an acceptable level to get transparency through the entire process available to either search engines or the public? I think that uh, OMB, or now it seems that Mr. Devaney is taking over the website, so it will be the Recovery Accountability and Transparency Board, uh, needs to issue guidance, and, and I would hope that my colleagues up here can, can answer this as well, can issue guidance, um, maybe after some collaboration where these guidance is developed, uh, it, it basically issue guidance that will tell cities, um, contractors, those who would actually be receiving monies and would have to be on the hook for reporting, um, uh, what they need to report. And so that we in the transparency community can ex know what we can expect coming down the pike. And I'm talking about what fields need to be added, which is what, you know, the name of the contractor, the cost, number of jobs created, So et you're saying they've got to define, you, somebody at the government side has to define the field right. so that when you answer the question, you put them into fields that are consistent, consistent. so they can be searched. Consistently across the country. And, um, and I want to emphasize that I hope this is done in collaboration with the folks on the ground in the cities, the folks in the transparency community who are interested in, in receiving the data and using it. So that's the first thing. The other thing is um, something that you've all been doing here today, which is sort of clarifying how deep uh, will the reporting go. Um, uh, because you, you need to clarify that it's going to go down to the ultimate terminal user of the money that they will be uh, uh, as on the hook as anybody else. And as you've gone through uh, the uh, legislation, would it be correct to say that Nowhere in there does it either provide for or require that there be reporting down to the contractor and subcontractor, nor is there authority for those rules to be created. I think that would be correct as far as saying um, that there's nowhere in the Act that it specifically says that all contractors and subcontractors or subgrantees, et cetera, are on the hook for reporting. Um, I'm not sure, um, it, neither does it prohibit it. Right, so I'm not sure that um, uh, authority is required. Maybe this is something that OMB could do, could require on its own. I'm not sure. Okay, so I think, Mr. Chairman, that's that's probably the one point we've gotten between Mr. Devaney and here, and I'd like to get responses from the others. Is that we don't have a clear answer to whether or not they will require it, and that they believe they have the rulemaking authority. I, I believe they do. By the way, I think by not by being silent on it, they do have the authority, but. That may be one for us to jointly ask uh, uh, the entire organization headed by uh, the Vice President about whether they intend to have those rules and whether they need any further action from us. And that may be our best joint follow-up. I have no objections to that at all. Okay. I look forward to working something out with our staffs. And for the others, I would appreciate this, this sort of your further belief on that point because to me, this oversight, which is proactive, which I'm very proud the chairman has done it on this basis, only is some good if we look for these things that we need to do now before those databases are created, filled with uh, material that's hard to read. Please. Mr. Chairman, I would agree that the sooner those decisions are made, the better for all of us who are going to be involved in reporting and auditing. 
we need you to be clear about what you want and communicate that to us. It may involve the need for some further coordination with training or, or some other type of uh, cooperation, but the sooner you can identify what you want us to provide, the better. We are used to juggling our systems with, with federal systems. We have a separate system for reporting with HUD. We have a separate system for reporting transportation funding. We find a way to integrate that with our own system so we can be as efficient and accurate as possible, but we need to know what you want. I would like to add, I, first of all, I consider, and I think it's important to register this, the procurement community in the public sector is part of the transparency community, and I want to make sure that we all understand in my profession and certainly our partners in the U.S. Congress that we definitely consider ourselves part of that community. But it, it's a well-intended plan right now, but not yet well executed, and this is what most concerns me. The, if this does not flow down from the top, what you have in an attempt to be transparent is 50 different state websites and probably 3,066 county websites and 70,000 cities and town websites, all of whom somewhere are in that chain of expenditure flowing down from this uh, great act. But you don't have transparency. What you have is an impenetrable morass. I any of us who've ever tried to even figure out how 50 states do business would, would find that a challenge because there is no single form in which we find the data. So I think, the, I, think I could talk forever on it, but that would only belabor what we all already know and what we've already said. Mr. Allen, if you have something in closing. M Mr. Gregan is right on. There is just the, the, the volume of information that's out there. Um, it's going to make uh, it very important for us to get clear guidance, clear, consistent guidance at the state level um, to those uh, receiving agencies and, the, and those governors to make sure that they're collecting the exact same information across the board and it's, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's filtered back up to the, uh, to the federal level in a consistent manner. Now, I'm, uh, just one follow-up yes or no question, if I could, Mr. Chairman. You know, the interesting thing is we're holding this specifically on $800 billion, nominally $800 billion worth of special funding. Is there any reason in the world that whatever we do here should not be the model for what we do on a consistent basis with all dollars the Federal Government sends out? I, I'd like to comment on that, if I may. My greatest hope, this is great, this is challenging for all of us, I think. This is very much challenging for my partners to my left and right here at this table and everyone else involved, in, including and maybe especially Mr. Devaney and his team. Um, but there are great opportunities here. And one is that this will force us, this will catalyze, I think, changes that have long needed to be made with respect to automatically posting every contractual transaction in governments to the web. It's public information, why not? Why would we not do that? Why would we wait for a Freedom of Information Act to do what anyone might be interested in the public? More importantly for me as a procurement professional, not all of us have the ability to administer contracts well. We spend all of our time going to the next contract and putting contracts in place. When contract administration, that part where you assure you're being delivered what you ordered, whether it's a good or service, is one of the most important areas where, where fraud can occur and where money can leak. We need to have contract administration as part of our profession, coast to coast. <coughs> And on top of that, internal audit. It's wonderful to get annual audits from the Inspector General. It's great to get CAFR audits and other audits. It's even better for me to be ahead, to have an internal audit capability, procurement professionals that I can have help me manage the delegated authority that flows through the law of agency from the Chief Executive, the Mayor of Washington, D.C., in my case, um, through the people that I trust to spend public money. So I'm hoping that this whole thing is really a catalyst for some fundamental and foundational changes to your question, Thank sir. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we, we've really, the, the end has been the best part of the whole hearing, so thank you. <laughs> but that, because you were part of that. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me, uh, first of all, let me thank uh, all of the witnesses and members, you know, who attended the hearing today. Before we adjourn, let me state that America demands that all stakeholders under the Recovery Act work in good faith to protect the public's interests and safeguard our unprecedented investment in America's future. I want to make it crystal clear that this committee will be watching and working feverishly in, to ensure accountability and transparency over these funds. Let me also uh, thank the ranking member, Mr. Issa, for his leadership in standing up with me to demand the strictest oversight I understand that the minority and majority staff worked on this hearing in a bipartisan manner, and that's the way it should be. And I look forward to continuing in this spirit of cooperation. Finally, 
Uh, I'm pleased, please let me, uh, uh, the record demonstrate uh, my submission of a binder with documents relating to this hearing. Without objection, I enter this binder into the committee's record. And without objection, the committee stands adjourned. And thank you again for coming. Thank you. Adjourned. Very good. Thank you.